Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our guest today is Mark Calabria, director of financial regulation studies at the Cato Institute. Today we're going to be talking about government housing policy, how it created the financial crisis, helped create the financial crisis and how it generally distorts the market. But at first, because it's generally the case with these when you're on mark, Aaron and I know very little about this. So we're going to be asking a bunch of possibly dumb questions. Uh, So the first question I think is – this 30-year fixed mortgage, I think historically too, it's important too. We hear about this all the time, your 30-year fixed mortgage. Like it's this – it has to be the case. It's the only way you could possibly buy a house. Why is this such a huge part of the American you know, marketplace? There, there really is uh, an obsession with the 30-year fixed And let's actually you know, back out I guess even uh, on a smaller level. Um, the reason it's 30 years is because that's obviously the amount of time that the mortgage is outstanding. Uh, a fixed rate obviously means that the rate does not vary over the term of the mortgage as opposed to adjustable rate mortgages. Uh, worth keeping in mind, most of the rest of the world uses adjustable rate mortgages far heavier. There are some distinguishing differences. I mean you can get a 20, 25-year fixed in Germany at a, at a rate that parallels what you can get uh, a 30-year fixed in America today. Um, and so some of the thinking of course is that while you have certainty in your payments, uh, I'll set aside that the, the typical life of a 30-year mortgage and of course I'm giving you a median. So of course there are some people who stay in that house for 30 years. The median is closer to seven or eight years in terms of how long someone stays in a house. Um, one of the policy rationales and it's really important to keep in mind, the seeds of the 30-year mortgage came out of the creation of the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, in the 30s, which started out with a 20-year mortgage uh, when it was created in the 30s, which is really revolutionary. Um, both in good and bad way. Um, and so up until the Great Depression, the typical mortgage was five or ten years, uh, sometimes a balloon payment, which meant that you would pay interest for a number of years and then all of a sudden you'd have a very big payment at the end. Uh, it's certainly important to keep in mind um, they were almost always refinanced. You know, They usually were rolled over. Uh, one way to think about it for those who follow commercial real estate is the typical residential mortgage pre the Great Depression looked like the typical co- office loan today. Obviously, it's a lot smaller, but you know a lot of the features that are common in the office market uh, were common in the residential market. Then. Such as what? what? So it could be interest only. Uh, it could be balloon. It could be for a short uh, time, uh, such as a five-year loan or a ten-year loan. Uh, it could be floating for part of that. Uh, and of course, some of the features we've saw during the crisis and pre-crisis. I should certainly say a lot of the things that we saw in the crisis were actually developed. Um, in the 70s and 80s to react to the very high rates of inflation we had. So the the fixed rate mortgage worked wonderful up until the 70s and 80s uh, when interest rates went up and the, all the savings and loan industry had these fixed rate mortgages on their books. So the, the, the first question, this might be the last question in some way, <laughs> way to too, but, but why is the government setting – the terms, the the durations of mortgages at all. It seems like that market would absolutely have. You can get a twenty year one, you get a seventeen year one. Hey, you want a sixty year one if you're really going long. It seems like they would have all those different availabilities. So the initial reason um, for extending the duration, it's it's another example of a crisis hits. Government intervenes to try to moderate the effects of the crisis and then that intervention doesn't go away. And so one of the reasons that 30-year mortgages are thought as attractive is that because you've stretched out the time that it amortizes, the monthly payments can be lower for the same house price. So if you're in the middle of the Great Depression and everybody has 10-year mortgages you know, and they've got a you – know, at the time would have been a $5,000 house or something uh, and they're paying a 10-year mortgage – then to lower the monthly payments, you refinance them into this 30-year mortgage. Suddenly, they've got the same size mortgage. They've got the same size house. Um, but now their monthly payments are a lot less. So it really was a reaction by the government to say, you know, let's kind of keep people in their homes by reducing their monthly payments. You know, we'll do a wink and a nod with the banks by – we won't actually forgive the loans, still same loan amount. Uh, and again, you have that extra duration uh, and it also allows borrowers over the course um, of cycles to actually bid for higher house prices. So one of the reasons um, that the real estate industry loves the 30-year mortgages, it allows you and I to bid more for a house. What did the banks think of this? 
So it's certainly important to keep in mind that most of the banks um, up until the, uh, the 20s – so national banks weren't even allowed to actually do mortgages until the 20s. Um, and for the most part, there is a concern about the fixed rate component of it. So let's think about there are at least two risks inherent in a mortgage. There's the credit risk, which is you know I give Trevor a mortgage, lend him money. Um, he's a deadbeat, doesn't pay me back. Um, that risk is to you as that, the that, lender. That, that risk is to me as a lender. The other risk of me to as a lender is the interest rate risk. And of course, this is the same for a borrower or for lender. Is that the interest rates change dramatically over the time of the mortgage? Why so, would why would that occur? So it could incur for inflationary reasons. Um, it could incur for business cycle reasons. So, for instance, um, the setting aside the actions of a central bank, which tend to, to reinforce this. Uh, in recessions, interest rates tend to fall because investment demand tends to fall. In expansions, interest rates tend to go up because investment demand tends to expand. Uh, and so if you have a adjustable rate mortgage, you know, in a the flip side would be in a recession, your mortgage payment should fall, which should be a consumption boost right when you want it. Uh, and of course, during an expansion, it would moderate your consumption. So adjustable rate mortgages actually are pretty good at moderating the business cycle. It's fair to say that what we have today commonly in America is kind of a one-way adjustable. So you might see this in commercial mortgages. You see this in the subprime market as prepayment penalties. But in the prime market, it's commonly understood that borrowers will refinance pretty heavily into a lower rate when rates fall. So we have it actually uh, – the fixed rate is kind of a misnomer. It is a uh, adjustable one way down in some ways uh, as long as you're not underwater and can, and can actually um, – qualify for a new mortgage. Well, let's take a step back so, sure, just so we can uh, get the big picture here. The, the, the Obviously, the interest rate is it's, – it's a price like anything else. Absolutely. It goes up and down based on whether or not there's a lot of – is it mostly demand for, for lending and a lot of – and whether or not there's a lot of supply of money to lend out. Is that pretty much what yeah, creates so the there's demand rate? and supply for loanable funds. And of course, there is you know, – inherently in all of that are discounted value of time. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that most of what the federal government has done, whether it's FHA, whether it's Fannie or Freddie, whether it's Rural Housing Service, there are a number of, of mortgage programs, actually just guarantee the credit risk. So this is one of the confusing elements of the debates you hear about Fannie and Freddie and the 30-year mortgage, which is what's interesting about a 30-year mortgage is the interest rate risk. But Fannie and Freddie don't actually cover that. They just cover the credit risk, which is the fact that somebody will repay. We need to we need to definitely clarify this. So the interest rate risk is the risk that the interest rate will go the the, the normal interest rate will go below what you're paying. Below or above. Or above. So you're so therefore your fixed rate is no longer going to be accounting for the interest rate. But the credit risk is the risk that the person just doesn't repay. Don't, doesn't pay at all. Or what about burns down the house? Is that also a credit That's risk? That's a credit risk as well, the, the underlying collateral risk. So let's keep an, a quick example would be what did in the savings and loan industry was savings and loans entered the 70s and 80s with long date – with 30-year mortgages on their books. Uh, and so if you've got a 5 percent mortgage on your books but all of a sudden the cost of your funds you know, becomes 10 percent, you're losing money real quick. Uh, and so – because deposits, which are mostly how savings and loans and banks are funded, uh, even on Wall Street, they might tend to be more shorter type funding. Um, since your shorter term funding goes up and down pretty quickly, banks would ultimately prefer to have the cost of mortgages match the cost of their funds and that way it reduces that risk. Now, we've made a broad public policy decision to say – um, that homeowners you know, should basically not really be able to get to choose. They do get to choose but we should put our thumb heavily in the scale uh, in the way of having financial institutions bear that interest rate risk rather than households. Let me ask what may be a very dumb question about the variability in the variable rate and where that comes from and how that's influenced by things outside of the relationship between say me, the borrower and you, the specific lender. So interest rates are often – I mean they – they come from a very basic level like if I want to borrow $100 from you, um, I have to pay you for not just – I have to pay you because you now don't have that $100. Exactly. And so I'm giving you some percent over time to compensate you for not having the $100 until presumably when I get to the end of the payoff. So period. some of that would be you're, you're paying me to defer my consumption. Right. Now, um, so that would – that's kind of the time, the time value element of it. So you could think about one of this is the time value element of it. Because I because that I don't see how like the variability that's a that's something we agree upon when we enter into it. And so the outside conditions, I don't see how those might impact that level of 
So built into the time value of money would be you know, the, the value of money going forward, so the inflation rate. So for instance, one of the reasons that uh, – and you've seen this a number of empirical studies have looked at this. Uh, the reason, for instance, that America has a higher share of fixed rate mortgages than say Italy is because we have actually despite um, – you know, I'll be the first one to pick on the Federal Reserve. But I'd also be willing to say that the record of the Federal Reserve you know, post-World War II has been better than the record of the Bank of Italy pre-euro. And so countries with very high rates of inflation uh, and very variable, unpredictable rates of inflation just don't have long-term financing. Uh, and so part of it is, again, you borrow, you borrow from me, you're paying me to defer my consumption, but I need to make sure that my consumption in the future when you pay me back is protected against inflation. Okay. Yeah, if you were in Weimar, Germany, it would be yeah. very hard to be like, I'll lend you a billion Reichs or, or a billion exactly. Deutschmarks now, but next week it's going to be worth so nothing. I, so I would emphasize you know, the, the, the biggest driver of whether a country uses predominantly fixed financing for its mortgage market is really the, its monetary policy in history of such. And the inflation rate. And yeah, that, that, that drives more than anything. But um, what about – see, the other part of the story though, which I think is the really interesting part of the story is that – there's a thing about – there's a political side to this. Oh, yeah. There's a thing about houses in America, which is – I mean I'm not the same in Europe. It, it, I mean people want to own houses in Europe, but it's not this constituent it's not element. It's baked into of, the American dream. Exactly. Your white picket fence and your Donna Reed show if you know, it's all a of our real listeners good, big fans of Donna Reed. I mean but it's, it's a very good question of why is there obsession about it in the US? Um, you know, certainly I should start – we we'll say among uh, developed countries, we're only 17th or 18th in terms of home ownership rates. So let's keep in mind, you know, places like Canada, Switzerland have higher home ownership rates. It does seem to be that countries that have more of an attachment to private property rights tend to have higher rates of home ownership, uh, and you do tend to see that. Now, of course, it's also a function of you know the affordability relative to incomes, uh, the ability to own land and property in general. But there is something uniquely American about obsessing about home ownership in a way that you generally just don't see around the rest of the world. Do we know? So there's we can compare actual home ownership rates, but is there? Can we compare? expected home ownership rates? Like are Americans yes. more likely to think that at some point in my life I'm going to own a home than people in other countries are? So they are and there have been studies. So for instance, um, it might be a shocker. Um, someone who's 25 is much less likely to own a home than someone who's 35. In somebody who lives in a rural community is much more likely to own a home than someone who lives in an urban area. So a number of studies have looked at this and said let's hold demographics constant statistically across countries and see if there's a big difference. And you certainly see most of the difference between the US and other countries goes away, but some of it still remains. So there's still so yes, the biggest differences are we're a wealthy country in which um, we have an older population. Countries that also have older populations tend to have high home ownership rates. But again, I would emphasize there is an unexplained residual uh, in those regressions that certainly suggests that there's something, an attachment in America to home ownership that's not at the same level. Right. But well, that's that's what I was asking about. I guess is not not expected in the sense of like will people actually at some point in the future, but in the way like you can. There, you'll see those those polls of like high school kids where you'll ask them how much do you think you'll be oh, yeah. making when you're 40, and they enormously overestimate the, how much they think they're going to make. And so the, that's well, what I'm getting is like Americans like American they, there are a lot of Americans who think like I'm going to own a home someday and then never will. And is that number? Whereas you might say, ask Canadians, do you think you're going to own a home someday? And they might be more realistic about it. That's a good question, and I haven't seen. Surveys that actually ask those questions. I will say um, there are a number of surveys that ask people in America what they think house price appreciation is going to be. And so on average, people tend to way overestimate how much they're actually going to see in appreciation. And of course, there's confusion between real and nominal values in that as well. Um, I think for the most part, I mean, if you consider that we've got a home ownership rate just, just over 64 percent, um, there have been certainly a number of studies that have tried to estimate the home ownership rate, and, and it is quickly accountable for a number of factors that make sense like age, household structure. Uh, it doesn't tend to have be – I don't think there's an exaggeration that a lot of people think they're going to be homeowners and not. It's a question of when. Uh, I'll also say because I know we're going to get to the conversation sort of about the financial crisis and the politics of it. One of the things I think we have not unique but different here is so much of our mortgage finance policy uh, is influenced by racial politics. 
And of course, as we all know, there are racial politics everywhere in the world. But they are certainly um, impact mortgage finance policy in a unique and dangerous way in America. So yeah, to return to the story, as you said, uh, the story so far, 30, the 30-year 30 fixed rate, the Federal Housing Administration, which was created in the 30s yes. during the New Deal. Um, now, you've mentioned – Fannie Mae. So if we're going to build up the constituent elements of federal housing policy up to the crisis, you mentioned Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. When did they come in about? So Fannie Mae was initially created about a year after FHA. It was created to be part of a government agency. So if you hear the term Ginny Mae today, Ginny Mae today is what Fannie Mae started out as, a wholly owned government agency that could only buy initially FHA loans. And where did it get the silly name? Because it's an acronym. It's a Federal National Mortgage Association. So I mean, and, and Freddie's got a similar name. Um, so Fannie Mae was created, I believe, in 34, uh, 35. So created after FHA in order to buy and create uh, a market for FHA loans. So there was a sense of we created FHA. Uh, lenders did not fall over themselves to participate. So how do we create a way to get people to participate? Uh, it's one of those things where um, first government and intervention is not all that successful. So how do you have another government intervention to put a patch on the previous government intervention that wasn't all that successful? And success here was home ownership rates. Success was really trying to move the mortgage market because for the first decade of both FHA and Fannie's existence, home ownership rates fell. Well, it was which a great depression was great. exactly. So um, of course the you know Paul Krugman was here. He'd say, "Well, it would have been worse." So of course we have no we have no counterfactual. We don't really know, um, but it's certainly fair to say that homeownership rates did not move much during this time. In fact, homeownership rates didn't move until after World War II. And of course, there are a lot of arguments for that. According to the VA loan program expansion of interstate highways and such, so Fannie was created in the '30s. Um, Fannie initially only bought mortgages. That's also something to keep in mind. Fannie and Freddie do not buy mortgages. They buy more – rather directly from the consumer. They buy mortgages from the banks. So, so, the, so the bank gives – Gives so you Bank of America makes you the mortgage. House. They you know, have the deed on the house. They're yes. paying deed to the, and then and then they can sell it to Fannie. They sell the mortgage to Fannie. And, Freddie. and then do you when your payments go? Do they go to? They, they go, go to, to Fannie, Fannie and Freddie, though they are serviced by the lender. So again, keep in mind, Fannie and Freddie are not set up in a way or supposed to interact directly with the consumer. Uh, and so initially, Fannie was set up to only buy from banks. Uh, Freddie was initially part of the savings and loan system and was set up uh, in the late 60s to buy from the savings and loan so that you had something parallel. Uh, and of course, after the savings and loan crisis, they were quote unquote privatized. Uh, and they were – charters were changed so that they could directly compete. So it wasn't until the beginning 70s that Fannie and Freddie could compete with each other. They had very different market niches before then uh, and very different business models. Also, we're saying uh, pre the savings and loan crisis, their market shares were in low single digits. So the truth was uh, Fannie and Freddie were largely irrelevant before 1980. Despite Fannie being around since the 30s, even though even though there's a government sponsored enterprise, it seems like it would be a more secure institution. And my, so let's let's keep in mind too that um, so Fannie initially in the 30s, if you go back and look at the authorized legislation, it was not meant to be unique. So what the Roosevelt administration had proposed was a number of bank-owned associations, essentially cooperatives. And when Fannie was initially created, it was owned by its bank members. And so it was thought to be that this would be multiples. It wasn't thought that there would be a government guarantee. In fact, that that's quite the opposite. Uh, it was thought to be that, again that this would well, – I guess I should add one of, the, one of the factors you have to understand in terms of development of our mortgage finance system is we – most of American history we had a very fragmented banking system and we've talked about this before. But the reason for that is that you've created Fannie and Freddie, FHA and many of these things to try to bring diversification benefits as an offset – to the restrictions on branch banking that you had. And these are the diversification we talked about in a previous episode that if you only have two banks and they're both based on the corn economy, then when yeah. corn goes, then are, both are, banks are, go. It's even more so the case in the mortgage market because you think about if you're a bank with that's located in one town and all of your mortgages are from that one town, you got a whole lot of risk concentrated there. And of course that that would still make it risk free on an agricultural product because there, there are absolutely. payments. So the whole point here being that the Lack of branching policies or the prohibition on branching and diversification meant that the government thought that there were too few mortgages being backed up and given, and so Fannie came in to make up this. He tried problem. to essentially try to diversify the risk. So one of the reasons, if not the primary reason, you don't see Fannie and Freddie institutions around the rest of the world uh, is because we are 
unique in how bad our branch banking restrictions were and the sort of you know financial protectionism we had for so long. Uh, and so you didn't need that – again, Fannie and Freddie were interventions created to offset the ill effects of previous interventions that were largely created at the state level. Interesting. Can I – this – so all of this was – all these kind of wheels within wheels were, were set up in order to goose home ownership. Um, I mean we, we decide like home ownership is a good thing. We want to improve well, these also, numbers. Construction jobs is a big okay. part, of, part okay. of it too. OK. But I, I guess what I want to ask is – so whether or not these, these particular policies are good or bad in the sense of they've, they can script the market, they can lead to financial crises, they can lead to other sorts of problems. The underlying motivation of it's good for people to own their homes is that true? Is it is it good for lots of people to own homes as opposed Aaron's to renting? Aaron's you should buy a house. I can tell this. <laughs> so I mean it's, it's, it's a very good question. There are lots of empirical studies that have tried to answer this and of course you have also problems with you know, causality. So there are a couple, a couple of issues here. So what does the research say that I think you can suggestively um, – that is very strong findings? So very strong findings are there are a whole lot of positive attributes that are correlated with home ownership. Um, we know that homeowners are more likely to vote. We know that homeowners are more uh, politically active. We know that homeowners are more likely to maintain their homes. Uh, we know that homeowners are more likely, uh, particularly for minorities, to send their kids to college. So there's a whole whole lot of um, positive social outcomes that are associated with homeownership. Now, of course, is something that we should all repeat to ourselves at least once a day. Correlation is not, is not causing. Well, there you go. <laughs> and so. There's a couple of things to pick out of that and the way I sort of characterize it sometimes is um, does home ownership make people responsible or is it likely that more respons that responsible people are more likely to become homeowners? And there is this chicken and egg. I, I think there's a bit of a feedback myself but uh, it's also important to keep in mind most of the studies look at the average homeowner, not the marginal homeowner. So the average homeowner could be a very different person in terms of financial stability and these and the responsibility characteristics than the person just on the margin who would have not but for the intervention become a homeowner. Um, so I would say I'm quite skeptical for another reason in that the vast majority of these so-called benefits associated with homeownership accrue to the individual. So think about it this way: if I'm Trevor's neighbor, you know I care that he you know doesn't leave junk in his yard and doesn't have his car up on center blocks. Um, if I don't live in Trevor's neighborhood, I care a lot less like about that. So most of the quote unquote positive externalities or negative externalities highly, highly localized. So you could say – I mean if you want to use – you could argue these are justifications for some types of zoning and such but they're not justifications for you know, federal home ownership policy as a whole. I'll also say as an aside um, or an important aside particularly in this – with this, this economic cycle we just came through which is there are also negative downsides of home ownership and the most obvious one is you're tied to your home. So for instance, a, a gentleman in the – a professor in the UK, uh, Oswald, I cannot remember his first name but there's something developed that's called the Oswald hypothesis uh, which has been supported across empirical studies US states as well which is the higher your home ownership rate, the higher your structural unemployment rate. That um, makes sense because mobility. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so you know, you think about it again. You know, when I think one of the problems in this crisis, which one of the difference in this crisis, previous recessions, the mobility rate of homeowners increased. In this last recession, the mobility rate of homeowners declined for a variety of reasons that we locked them into place. And so one of the downsides of homeownership is, you know, if you're that carpenter in Tampa who gets laid off, who really ultimately, for your own good and for society's good, probably should move to Dallas and get a job. You're more likely to stay in Tampa and write it out in these circumstances. So there are negative consequences. I would probably say as much as a percentage point uh, of, un of excess unemployment rate this time around came from because of our high level of ownership going to the crisis. So by the 50s, of course, we have this big housing boom that occurs with some of the things you mentioned, right. the veterans loans and things like this. And, and Fannie is diversifying the market. Freddie said comes about in the 60s for the savings and loan yeah. market, which – and actually for our listeners and for me too actually. Can you explain the exact difference between a regular bank and a savings and loan? Well, today there's almost no difference. I mean they, they, they have eroded. Um, you know, so this is something that has developed you know, over 100 plus years. So 
banks initially, as I mentioned, national banks couldn't even do mortgages at all until the 1920s. This was Hoover's great invention. His commerce secretary was let's get banks into home ownership. Um, so between the Civil War and the 1920s, national banks could not do uh, real estate loans at all. They were very limited to uh, commercial short-term loans. So they were very different cycle. And then the savings and loans, which were up into that point, exclusively state chartered institutions, uh, that almost exclusively did mortgages. And so you've seen a convergence over time in these charters to where today they don't make a whole lot of difference. You know, there are still some regulatory definitions that require savings and loans or thrifts, however you want to call them, um, to be more involved in real estate. But again, that has eroded over time. They used to have their own insurance funds. Uh, they used to have some different treatment in this. But again, more – and the savings and loans like, up until I think the 70s also were not taxed like credit unions are today. So again, there were some differences but those have eroded over time. So what was the the next if we're at the uh, at the 60s um it, what in the 70s had the inflation caused some of the problems but what was the next mistake in this line if we're moving up uh big well, let's, let's, reinvestment act yeah. or things so like let's, that. So let's let's keep in mind that we went into World War II with a national home ownership rate somewhere in the mid 40s. Uh, by the time we got to the 60s, so the really big increase in home ownership rate was the late 40s and 50s. So we entered the 60s with the homeownership rate around 64 percent, which is about where it is today. Um, and so most – again, there's a lot of studies that debate these issues, whether it was FHA, VA, interstate highway system. You know, and of course, interstate highway system expanded the supply of housing, brought down its supply. And of course, there was a lot of um, forced savings, if you will, during World War II. A lot of money and ability to make down payments coming out of that and of course, materials that were taken from war use and put in the housing. So – Bang, we're at the 60s. We've hit the homeownership rate we are today. Um, you really entered the 60s and, and, and entered the 70s with a lot of social unrest because we all know um, was not a happy time in America for a variety of reasons. And you saw at that point the reaction and this first came in FHA. It for, you know, CRA was something later in the 77 where there was a sense of you know, let's deal with urban problems uh, by trying to increase home ownership. And of course, I mean to some extent the simplistic thinking of it was you know, somebody's not going to burn down their own neighborhood or their own house. Uh, somebody's not going to break the window on there. So some of this was how do you – I mean pre predecessor to, to Bush's ownership society of the 2000s, you had an ownership society uh, mentality in the 60s and 70s that tried to expand home ownership. You say that the home ownership in the 60s was about the same as it is now, but was it demographically the same? Like are there groups that didn't that didn't own homes then that do more now or does does the picture look more or less identical? Perversely enough, it looks worse for some of the groups in which you, you actually want to try to help. Today it does or it did. To, today than it does. So let's start with to me what I think is very shocking observation which is um, – and we have census data back for, for, for some time. So 1910, the ownership gap between African Americans and Caucasians was about 23 percentage points. So that meant that the homeownership rate for Caucasian households is 23 percent percentage, which is higher than that for African Americans. Today, that gap is 22 percentage points. So in a hundred years, we have reduced the percentage gap one point. Um, now, it, that might sound bad enough if it wasn't a straight line, but the fact is is that that percentage gap actually had steadily but smallly uh, declined until about 1980. So 1980 actually was the low point in gap and again, it was about 19 percentage points, which was before really the growth of securitization. So we made some very modest gains, um, mostly post-World War II, mostly 60s. All of those gains were essentially reversed to where we're almost back where we were pre-progressive era, pre-New Deal in terms of homeownership rates by race. Um, of course, I should say as an aside and there's a lot of debate uh, how much of this is driven by racism and of course th for a very long time, very extensive ugly racism in our residential housing market. There's no debate about that. Very well documented. Uh, there's certainly a debate about how extensive that is today versus then. But um, there are a number of studies that have looked at and said within the United States how much are homeownership rates determined by demographics, family structure, income and these things. And you see almost the entire – difference and gap go away when you look at factors like 
homeowner, like like income, family structure. Um, now, of course, then you court of, you can of course regress that to say, well, of course, those income differences and those family structure differences and the you know all those wealth differences are all you know other factors. And of course, that's one of the bigger you know sort of knots within federal mortgage policy is the use of federal mortgage policy to try to fix all those other factors. And the Community Reinvested Act was related to trying it to fix some of these gaps. It was a little bit, correct? but let's keep in mind. Okay, so what the the Community Investment Act has been sort of ex characterized, I, I think, you know, it, it mischaracterized by both its proponents and opponents. So let's go back to what we talked about earlier, and we've talked about in previous conversations about um, local banks had monopolies for a very long time in America. What does a monopoly do? Monopoly restricts supply, raises price. Um, so accordingly, with this, with the very short and again, the original Community Investment Act is only a few pages long. It's not that long, less than ten pages. Um, what it essentially says is. You know, you shall make credit available in your community. So there was a real concern that banks were essentially gathering deposits in their communities, following them off to higher valued uses elsewhere, uh, or that because they were engaged in the local monopolies that they were restricting credit. So in a sense, I look at the initial CRA is an attempt, again, to offset previous government interventions that restricted entry and created local monopolies. So it, it, essentially, it was an initial attempt to try to nudge the monopolist to increase production a little bit, uh, and in this case, that's loans. It did not become a sort of quota system until the Clinton era in, in 1995. So the initial CRA was very process driven. Um, didn't really have much teeth at the beginning either, because it only mattered when you were trying to merge. Um, and so it's not only the 1995 regulatory changes. It's also the 1994 Regal Neal Act, which removed restrictions on branch banking, which set off the merger wave. So this is also as an aside in the banking context. The big growth and consolidation uh, of banking was not, you know, the repeal of Glass Steagall, because by '99 it was really be between '94 and '99 that the big growth and consolidation happened. So you had, uh, and you also had a number of other things. The Home Mortgage Disclosure Act uh, was was passed in the seventies. Uh, you Fair Credit Acts were passed in the seventies. So you really had this sense of trying to open up access to credit markets. And again, I, there's, I don't think there's any debate, uh, evidence, and, and, and anecdotal evidence as well as empirical academic evidence. Uh, our housing markets, you know, certainly up until the seventies and early eighties, were certainly characterized by discriminatory behavior. And when do we get the the legendary? Subprime mortgage. Uh, so what, what is the subprime mortgage? Okay, that's a good question because then? people throw the term around a lot. Um, so subprime can either mean the borrower or the loan. Now, in the borrower, the usual cutoff is so. I guess just say we all have credit. Most of us have credit scores. The leading credit score provider is Fair Isaac, which produces the FICO score. There are other credit score providers out there. Um, but the usual cutoff in um, the housing market or in the credit market, anyhow, I guess I should say FICO was initially developed for credit card lending, uh, but is used widely in mortgage lending. Is anything under a 660 or a 620 tends to be the cutoff for subprime? Let me emphasize: this data is incredibly strongly predictive. Somebody with a 620 FICO or a 580 FICO, and I believe the bottom is maybe 350. It gives them 350 about low around 800. So somebody in the, in the 600s, in the 500s has a very high probability of not paying you back. And again, that's just a fact. Now, there are debates about you know, how much we could extend this. Um, now, the other type of subprime is often considered the product. So a lot of products that were risk layered, so you could think about pick a payment or option arm that would negative dramatize, which would mean you actually increase the length of your principal. Um, you know, so a number of loans were thought of as high risk regardless of whether if they were given to high credit borrowers. And for the most part, these high risk loan characteristics were almost exclusively given solely to people with high credit scores. So you do see this breakdown. What would some what kind of risks would be there that aren't a factor of the Borrower's credit score. So, for instance, um, a negative amortization loan where you build principal, so or an interest only loan. So, if you have a situation where the house becomes increasingly underwater, like for instance, one of the empirical findings, um, and this should not be surprising when you think about it, higher credit, higher income borrowers are more likely to walk away if the mortgage is underwater. 
they're, 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 they're more ruthless is the way the literature puts it. And again, it's like they have a better sense of what their financial situation is. They understand that in most places like California, a mortgage is non-recourse, which means a lender can only go after you for the house. And so you actually see this uh, more ruthless behavior, if you will, on the higher end income. Um, and so that's an offset. And so you often will see a bigger requirement to have more equity in, in those markets. Um, but again, the point is, is that by and large, subprime talks about first, the borrower credit history, second, some characteristics of the loan that might actually um, you know, be a higher risk. Like for instance, during the bubble and you're starting to see this come back, you might have seen loans with over 100 percent loan to value, like 110, even 120 percent loan to value loans. Trevor Explain exactly what that means. Trevor Burrus So loan to value, the size of the loan divided by the value of the house. So 100 would be that the house value and the mortgage are equal. Um, that's already high risk given that you're going to have to pay 5 or 6 percent to get out of the house if you need to sell it uh, in transaction costs. And so when you start to get above 90 percent and 95 percent and certainly above 100 percent, the risk of the loan starts to skyrocket even for good credit borrowers. Uh, and of course, that's because it's, it's, it's looked at as uh, you're out of the money, it's a, it's a risk, stick it to the lender and walk away. And we've started to see this sort of quote unquote strategic default behavior become more and more of an issue. So estimates were that back in the late 80s, 90s, about 6 percent of defaults were quote unquote strategic default, which means you can't pay – you can pay but you don't want to. And that's, and that, and that's only it. The estimates this time around are that strategic defaults were somewhere between 25, 40 percent of the foreclosures. In the 2008 Yes, era. the cycle. So this is – you mentioned the non-recourse. It seems to be the case. If they can only recover the house itself, does that even include any depreciation on the house? So one of the problems – I mean I guess it's probably depend on your perspective. Um, we've seen increasingly over time – uh, you could think about it being borrower friendly, but it can, of course, lenders aren't stupid. They take offsets um, where it's increasingly easy to get out of paying a mortgage. So for instance, uh, you know, at the height of the crisis, the median time to a foreclosure uh, in Chicago was something like a thousand days. So you could literally be in your house and make no payments. Make no payments for over three years before they got rid got you out. That seems to raise the price. This is something my yes. dad complains the, the about. The free rent that that and of course the ton of empirical studies that find that this shockingly uh, increases foreclosure rates. Yeah, my wow. dad my dad does housing banking stuff, and this is a thing that there are actually organizations. Uh, that will tell you online. Oh yeah, how to get how, how to, get how out to of your stay mortgage. the longest though too. It'd be like you know, send this letter in and then don't sign it or, or send it later. Forget, keep you know, stuff. the 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 during the New Deal. I mean, so we set up something in the Roosevelt said something called the Homeowners Loan Corporation, which worked with FHA. Uh, FHA loans are actually by law a recourse, but government doesn't exercise that. Uh, during the 30s, they were aggressive. If you got a mortgage refinanced by the federal government under the Roosevelt administration and you didn't pay it, they came out. They garnished your wages. They made you move. They were quite aggressive. And of course, there is this moral hazard aspect. Now, of course, I'll say is I don't think that should um, make us forget that the number one reason why somebody doesn't pay their mortgage is because they've lost their job. It's almost predominantly labor market driven. Mm-hmm. And the subprime stuff, uh, did it just spring into existence in the 90s or something? Did, right, did they you're exist in these the 70s? Like, basically, these sound like these are idiotic risky, loans. loans. Yeah. So, why? Like, so why all of a sudden so did So there's a happen? couple of different, different issues going on. I mean I, and I also – this most recent was not the first boom and bust in the subprime mortgage market. We had a boom and bust in the 90s. Um, but the during the 90s, most subprime mortgage lending was done by state chartered finance companies. So there were no insured deposits, no Fannie and Freddie. Um, hard money lenders who put their own money in or they funded themselves short term uh, on Wall Street. During the uh, – maybe we should say the first because it's probably not going to be the last Russia default. Um, in the 90s, interest rates skyrocketed. About a third of these guys went out of business and it was no financial crisis. The difference was in the 90s, if you were going to get a subprime loan and you were a 620 FICO, you were going to put 30 percent down. And so we got over time – and I very much remember I was on Capitol Hill at the time, banking committee staff, where in the early 2000s, I certainly had a chain of community activists coming through my door lobbying me saying, you know, we really need to get Fannie and Freddie into subprime to clean up that business. Uh, and of course, there is this sense in Washington that somehow if your credit score is something that happens to you rather than something that you might have something to do with. And so there's long been a push. We saw it in the Clinton administration. We saw it in the Bush administration to try to close this racial homeownership gap I talked about. 
And so the only ways for you really to do that were to either – either are uh, lower the age profile of homeowners uh, and lower the credit profile because unsurprisingly, somebody who is 25 on average has a lower FICO score than somebody who's 35 because, of course, you need time to build your credit and such. So a lot of the expansion in the 2000s, we literally – for households under 25 came close to doubling their home ownership rate. In the little last decade, you said under, under 20? twenty-five. You know, we went from something like um, you know thirteen percent to twenty some percent. I sure, I should not I should not have owned a house under twenty-five. Yeah, I can tell you that. that. Like, that I don't think I've met a twenty-five year old. Most of them are still living with their parents. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Well, you know, unfortunately, we have not learned what I think should be an obvious lesson, which is if you try to have a federal policy geared at let's get a lot of twenty-two year olds in the home ownership, it's probably not going to work out well. The depreciation alone is going to be a problem. I know they're going to punch through the walls. And, 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 and that's yeah. on top of the student debt they now have. So we double whammy for that for that generation. Um, but again, the very large difference in age profiles between minorities in Caucasians was one of the drivers here. Uh, and so for you to close that gap, you had to deal with the subprime issue. You had to deal with an age issue. And the way it addressed was lowering underwriting standards. Uh, and so I will say as an aside, I mean Peter Wallison at AI has a new book out now where he's documented and to me, some of the documentation he's brought up really reminds me of some of those conversations t you know, 10, 12 years ago where there really was a push. And I guess I should certainly say um, this is another example of really good intentions going bad. Um, you know, I, I, for instance, I worked at the National Institute of Realtors before I worked on the Hill, and one of the things I worked on was their outreach to African American communities on wealth building, home ownership, and you'd have these conversations with very earnest people about, well, you know, that twenty some percentage point gap is clearly racism, and we can eliminate it without taking additional risk. Of course, that was. Absolutely false. So I think there are a lot of good intentions who felt like we could just really expand homeownership risk-free and cheaply. And of course, that did not turn out that way uh, and turned out to be very costly for the government, for the economy and most importantly for the families themselves that were involved. And it leaked into the market. I think the important thing too here is that it, it wasn't just – people losing their homes is because they had been turned into securities, yes. which we mentioned. But I think we need it's to crucial, redefine what a security is element and then it. linked into the market and therefore polluted everything, correct? So can you, actually, we need to redefine security. I think we did that in our last episode, but it's a, it's a worthwhile thing. So let's thing keep in mind, you know, we, we pretty regularly almost like you know, clockwork, you can set your watch and say, oh, it's been, 50, it's been five, six years, we're going to have another boom bust. We every you know, 10 to 15, 20 years have booms and busts in the housing market in the US. The last one was historically the largest. But you know, we certainly had booms in the 50s and the 70s. We had a boom and bust beginning in the 80s and late 80s. So housing markets uh, are volatile. So you know, first of all, for those listening who think about a home, if somebody tells you that home prices only go up, you should slap them. Um, <laughs> There's one thing you remember from this episode. One thing you remember. <laughs> housing prices go around slapping can, people can, who and say do, that. can and do go down. I'll say interestingly as an aside, you know, Bob Schiller who recently won the Nobel who's at, who's at Yale assembled a house price series back to 1890 and you know, a lot of the earlier decades, you can question the quality of it. But one of the interesting findings of his data, a lot of volatility but basically in real terms, if you bought a house in 1890, you had no appreciation for the next 100 years in real after inflation terms, 100 years. I mean I'm not going to say flat because again, a lot of volatility but even if you held on to it, you basically made what you paid after inflation. So you know, there is a question over how great of an investment housing is and, and many of my advocacy friends who are big homeownership advocates will first say, well, it's the only investment that you know, poor people can get into on a highly leveraged basis and of course, I repeat that to them and say that's actually what you want to achieve is to get people highly leveraged. And of course, people don't understand that leverage cuts both ways magnifies the losses as well as the gains. Now, I guess if your assumption is that the taxpayer is going to, hit, is going to eat the losses, then maybe you don't care. Um, so back to the securitization question. This was really the first housing crisis that was securitization driven. And so again, you know, we had the savings and loan crisis was very ugly. We paid $150 billion in the bail the savings and loan industry. Um, it arguably might have cost you know, the first George Bush's reelection. Uh, but you know, it didn't cause a global financial crisis in the same way. And the reason was up until starting late 80s, early 90s, the typical way a mortgage was done was the person you sat across the table from, originated from, held that mortgage. It was what was called an originate to hold model. We moved with the growth of Fannie and Freddie and later the private label market to an originate to sell a securitized model. So you had growth of mortgage brokers 
which really were mostly the sales guys who were involved in the SNLs at first. So you'd sit across the table from somebody who's got no money at all, whose job really is just to close a loan and then quickly sell it, you know, quote unquote, table fund it to Fannie and Freddie, uh, who would wrap it into security and sell it to the securities markets. And so the attempt really was to sort of connect. And the Main security Street. is now just a tradable package of mortgages. Yeah, absolutely. So and the you, idea is just to aggregate the the yeah, risks. So exactly. Some so of you, them might be good. Some of them might be bad. That was exactly the thinking. So you 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 would diversify the risk by putting the mortgages. The thinking was that you know a pool of a hundred or a thousand mortgages was going to be riskier than any, safer than any one of the individual mortgages. It was also thought to be more liquid. You know, mortgages traditionally have not been a very liquid asset, meaning you couldn't as a lender sell them very quickly without taking much of a loss. So the thinking was if you put them in a mortgage-backed security, you have um, a liquid security that the market understands so that if you need to raise money, you can do that pretty quickly. So – and this was all you know, pre you – know, this, this was all a growth of the 90s for the most part. You know, again, pre-savings and loan crisis. Um, the securitized mortgage market was really just a rounding error again up until almost 1990. Uh, and so you saw the growth of the securitization market. That spread these securities throughout the financial system. Banks held them, um, you know, about a third of their collateral on the overnight repurchase mortgage mor – repurchase market and the repo market, which is how um, mutual funds and hedge funds and investment banks often buy themselves. A third of that collateral is Fannie and Freddie securities. You know, an, an, another fourth was private label mortgage-backed securities. So what we did of particular danger in this, because I'll certainly say as an aside, if you map out prices in office properties or retail properties or shopping centers, they displayed the same pattern as we saw in the housing market this past time around. And of course, that should not be not be surprising. Um, you know, the interest rate sensitive assets and, and all the land use controls and restrictions hit those types of assets as well. But the difference was is when the office market went boom and bust, it did not cause a financial crisis because we hadn't spread the risk in the same way and the same amount of leverage in it. So for instance, even for Fannie and Freddie, so Fannie and Freddie also buy loans on office buildings. I mean, no, sorry, sorry about that, apartment buildings. But the typical apartment loan that Fannie and Freddie would buy would have 50 percent equity, 50 percent debt. Whereas the typical mortgage they would buy would be 95 percent debt, you know, 5 percent equity. So there was a lot more leverage in the single family side than there was in the apartment side, uh, even though, of course, apartment dwellers tend to be younger, less attachment to the labor force. So there's certainly a risk there. Um, but again, more prudent underwriting, more equity by, by the – on the part of the, the originator and the owner. Uh, and so because we spread this mortgage risk into the financial system, that really was one of the things, uh, if not the most crucial thing that sort of let the fire behind the system. And as I mentioned, you know, Peter Wallace earlier has written about the housing goals, uh, Fannie and Freddie. And we really did see Fannie, Freddie and other market participants greatly lower their credit quality. Uh, and so maybe to put things – you know, in perspective, so you know, I often use 1960s kind of a turning point in the housing market in a big way, partly because that's where we hit the trend rate we have now of home ownership. Also important to keep in mind, up until 1960, the uh, majority of homeowners owned their homes free and clear. The majority. The majority. Really? The majority had no mortgage at all. Wow. Now, now of course, I mean that is home ownership. It's, it's that's your, real home ownership. It's, it's yeah. real home ownership. So. It's important to keep in mind that we and today, even today, about you know a third of homeowners um, own their homes free and clear. Uh, so there are people who actually do pay their mortgages, and you know, uh, rather than just pull equity out the entire time. And so you saw this erosion over time, where we increased the amount of leverage behind ownership. So my back of the envelope was first on the um, institutional side, so the banks and Fannie and Freddie and all those who held the mortgage market. At the height of the crisis, we're leveraged about sixty to one. Now, explain exactly so, what that means. So that means that you've got sixty dollars of debt for every one dollar of equity you have, which means does not give you much much room to go wrong. And so, for instance, Fannie and Freddie do a number of things. One of the things they do when they package mortgage backed securities and sell them is they wrap a credit guarantee around it and they charge a guarantee fee. Their guarantee business, which is about half their business, was by statute leveraged over two hundred to one. So it meant that all they needed to do was take half a percentage point of loss on that business before that business was wiped out. So, so to, just to clarify, that just means that the the pre depreciation, the loss of it in some way, just needs to be a half a percent. Then the guarantee business is a loser. Yeah, yeah. because it's one to two hundred. Yeah. yeah. So it really is. Um, I mean, so 
you know, Peter Wilson. Yeah, the, the, the leveraging puts you at risk. I guess the big problem here, because I'm not a finance guy, but the it, the high leveraging puts you at higher risk to unknown things that might happen in the world yeah. that change that relationship. It between puts your debt so and your whether it's assets. leverage on the part of the borrower or on the part of you know the investor lender, it puts you at a greater risk of insolvency bankruptcy. So uh, you think about. You know, if 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 you're a homeowner, you know, and you don't have much equity in your house, then if prices go down, you could find yourself underwater. Now, let's be clear, because some of the, if if you read the, you read the papers, you somehow think that being underwater triggers a foreclosure. It does not. The the lender actually doesn't want your home if it's underwater, um, but it changes the incentive for people to walk away. It also changes the incentive in that often what triggers a foreclosure is you know kind of what economists will call double trigger. You lose your job. But if you lose your job and you have a lot of equity, you can borrow against it and you've got a reason to stay and you can weather that. If you lose your job or you have you know, the Elizabeth Warren favorite of you've got uh, unexplained medical costs that throw you into bankruptcy, well, you know, if you've got home equity to tap, you can make it through that way. If you don't have home equity, then you cannot or it makes it much more difficult to, to get to survive the first trigger. Uh, and of course, it also changes the incentives for people to walk away in strategic default. So A, we've reduced the cushion for bad things to happen on the homeowner side. We also reduced the cushion for bad things to happen on the financial side. Uh, part of this was, of course, the capital treatments. I mean, you know, example I like to give is it wasn't atypical for Bank of America to take a thousand mortgages, sell it to Fannie Mae, buy back the mortgage-backed securities, holding those thousand mortgages back on the Bank of America's balance sheet. It kept the interest. Yeah, you're looking like why? Oh, that, is a, that seems why? like that makes no sense. That sounds yeah. like Enron style accounting because <laughs> it is. Um, so what it was really done was because it was uh, capital arbitrage. So if Bank of America did that and bought back the very same mortgages but wrapped as mortgage-backed security, it could cut the level of capital it held in half, which also means the flip side is we've doubled the leverage in the system. We've doubled the vulnerability of the system. So we've had a lot of rules gamed into the mortgage system that greatly increased leverage in the system. Uh, and because housing is often f relatively fixed in supply, even at the top of the bubble 2006, we were building about 2 million units. Keep in mind, we've got about 120 million units. So at, n at, the, at the most heated, craziest part of the bubble, we are expanding supply less than 2 percent. This seems so to be directly we, tied to government policy. Yes, let me let me see how this this so we've got this whole story now that I'm understanding it. We we attempted to increase home ownership, and as a result of all these policy interventions and institutions we set up, we have increased the number of people who have poor credit, who are risky, who are have mortgages. We have increased the amount that those people are leveraged, or that people in general are leveraged, which means that the the lenders are more leveraged. We've increased – we've then taken these things, bundled them up, sold them all over the place, which has spread all of this throughout the system. But then how do we get from that to the financial crisis? Sure. And so the way to think about it is a lot of what we've done on the mortgage side for the homeowner is trying to ultimately increase the demand for housing. And so you could think about it like for instance, you know, the down payment's a good suggestion. Um, you know, if the down payment is five percent and you've got five thousand dollars, then you could get a hundred thousand dollar house. If the down payment is two and a half percent, then suddenly you can buy a two hundred thousand dollar house. And so you allow people to bid at a higher rate. Uh, and of course if you buy down the interest rate, so Fannie and Freddie were widely believed to lower interest rates somewhere between seven and twenty basis points. Is that because of their the, the because fact of, that they because were the perception that they were government backed and they could borrow at near treasury rates and so some amount of this and there's a large debate about how much but to set aside the quantitative the qualitatively rates were lowered by a small amount by Fannie and Freddie uh, and so not enough to increase home ownership rates you really have to get rate reductions of near two percentage points which are 200 basis points to see any real movement in home ownership rates. So largely what was done was the rates were lowered slightly and that allowed people within the same monthly payment to bid more for the house price. So these often quote unquote interventions uh, in the housing market just allowed borrowers to bid more for the house without actually changing the home ownership rate although the home ownership rate did increase during the bubble. So we got, we got people in, uh, we got them in by via more debt. Let's also keep in mind uh, during this time for a variety of reasons which are outside of the scope of this conversation, you saw fairly stagnant income growth during that time. So the housing bubble was not driven by you and I and everybody else making a whole lot more money in real terms. It was driven by credit. 
Ian, so that pushed up house prices and because in many price places, housing supply is inelastic, uh, you just pushed up prices without actually increasing construction much. And then because those mortgages were packaged into mortgage-backed securities spread throughout the system, you know, they all seemed like very low risk. You know, everybody was making a lot of money uh, and increasing housing prices can cover up um, you know, a lot of problems. Uh, is, uh, I guess it's uh, Warren Buffett's one of his favorite saying is that you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide comes in. <laughs> uh, and that's the same thing. You don't really know who's highly leveraged and who's risky until prices turn. But at some point, you you know, ultimately hit how many people you could have. So there's something um, in finance that's occasionally called the greater fool theory. In the, uh, the 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 thinking is that you know a lot of people were essentially buy an asset on the belief that somebody else will be there to buy it from them at a higher price. And of course, you know, that some people, yeah, yeah, that that can't that go, can't on, go forever. on forever. It, yeah. it's, it's it's like musical chairs. Eventually, you know, there's not enough chairs. Uh, eventually, you are the greatest fool, and there's nobody else left to take that off your your table. And so that's what we did. We eventually hit that wall. Uh, in about 2006 where we had gotten everybody who wanted to be a homeowner who was still breathing in uh, and then the demand slowed down and then you started to see construction slow down. Um, you know, you started to see construction jobs lost. And so it's also important to keep in mind there's a couple of different factors here. And so one of the things that always bears reminding is we were in a recession for a year at a minimum before the financial crisis hit. We had already lost 2 million jobs before September 2008. Um, a lot of those were construction jobs and so there is a degree to which the economy drives finance as well as finance driving the economy. And so what there really was I think in the in, – in starting actually in August of 2007 but more so in, in, in the fall of 2008 are really a wake up to, wow, we thought all these housing investments were really safe because they had been paying off really well for a number of years. Uh, and let's keep in mind you know, we had – the housing market had hit bottom in 1994 and kept going you know, to 2006. So a 12-year stretch is almost unheard of. Um, and of course, part of it was, was the Federal Reserve just flooding liquidity into the system after the dot-com bubble and after 9-11. But so you saw this spreading of risk where market participants suddenly looked at this and said, wow, you know, the buyers aren't coming. Uh, I'm the greater fool. Uh, and so that's also why a lot of Wall Street banks got stuck with holding a lot of mortgages and mortgage-backed securities because, again, they thought they could continue to churn them out. Uh, and so some of this, uh, again, was a repricing of risk in, in the mortgage market. I actually think some of the interventions that sparked this was in 2006, something called the ABX index was created, which is an index based on the value of subprime mortgage-backed securities. So uh, up until about 2006, there was no way for you to short the housing market in a sustained way. I mean, you could try to short home builder stocks and this and that. Ex shorting is, uh, is shorting is betting, betting on something going yeah, down. Yeah, right? exactly. And so you didn't have any way to bring pessimism in the balance of the market. And you know, for those of you who ever you know read the Big Short, it's a great narrative. Uh, of how a couple of guys tried to short the market and how they made a lot of money doing it. Uh, you didn't really – really was very difficult to do that before 2006. Uh, and you also had around 2006, Case and Schiller, uh, as I mentioned, Bob Schiller, the Nobel winner, put together a house price index which is traded on the Chicago you – know, the ME, the CME now. So you could hedge your house price risk and, or, and on the flip side of it, you could also bet on house prices. So it was the, was the net result of this that they started – Looking at the downside of the market, there were now so institutional things looking at the other side. I would say starting in about 2006 but building to 2008, you had what I would call an information shock. Suddenly, you know, the stream of never-ending borrowers dried up. Suddenly, the expectation that housing prices would continue increasing, covering up problems, you know, really started to, you know, hit home that that wasn't sustainable. Uh, and then you saw the market adjust and prices start to fall. And of course, when the housing prices started to fall, that resulted in foreclosures going up, delinquencies going up, which resulted in the value of the mortgage-backed securities going down. Uh, none of this was really a mystery. I mean I think the broad ca characteristics of it were well understood. It's just that the model we had made it a system that was so much more highly leveraged than the previous system, which itself was highly leveraged. It's not like the, it's not like the savings loan industry was not leveraged. So it seems that we created a system that we we put a lot of incentives in there via government to do some very bad things, uh, but we're have we learned our lesson? Are we are we still have we created a situation where there's going to be a boom and bust cycle again? And we I don't know if the housing crisis and the financial crisis was just some sort of black swan event that that will never happen again, or have we learned our lesson? Are we still promoting housing in an irresponsible way? 
we have, if anything, doubled down. Um, you oh, know, great. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, just true. So let's start with, um, you know, and, and Randy O'Toole here at Cato has written about the, the supply aspect of this. And so start, what, the thing is, we really did have a perfect storm of bad behavior. It's just all of those, most of those bad behaviors still here. So starting in the 90s with the, with the expansion of zoning and growth controls and stuff, I mean, we went in 10 years from Orlando being an easy place to build to having a growth boundary. Um, so we increase the we in, increase the inelasticity of supply and housing. So which means that housing prices will going forward all else equal be more volatile. That's still in place. If anything, it's worse than it was. Um, we've increased the government guarantees. So the moral hazard that's there in terms of lack of market discipline on the mortgage market is still there. Um, we've actually made it easier now for borrowers. I mean. You know, there's going to come a day in the future where lenders will look nostalgically back on, oh, only a thousand days to foreclose. Those were the good old days. Oh my gosh! Um, it will be harder to foreclose next time around. Why should we even charge them prices? Yeah, for exactly. Housing, it seems well, like. we we are, you know, with, at the risk of some slight amount of exaggeration, we're going down the path where mortgages are becoming unsecured unsecured loans that are just a little better than credit cards. Uh, and now you've seen some offset in that, and so of course by a little better than credit cards, I mean the ability to the ability to, to actually collect, to collect back from the collateral. Is, is, yeah. Okay, so um, you've seen lenders, of course, react to that by saying, "Well, I'm not going to make loans to people who aren't going to pay me back." Uh, and of course, that what has, a shock! Yeah, <laughs> wow. You know, you tell you tell you tell a lender you can't get the house back. They're suddenly like, "Well, I'm not going to give it to people. I'm not going to get the house back from." Uh, it, but of course, the political process is not going to live with that because, of course, homeownership is great and good and great wealth making overnight. You know, gamble machine for everybody that we need everybody into. And the politicians love it. So, uh, and you've seen, you know, unfortunately, the you know the president recently has has gone down this path as his has his HUD secretary. So we had a few years. Um, I mean, like I say it's amazing to me in my lifetime to hear Democrat presidents say Fannie and Freddie should go away. Uh, can't say I expected that to happen. Uh, so we had a few years where there was a rebalancing of the conversation. Those years are behind us. Uh, actually, I expect any day now that people start telling me again that housing prices only go up. So um, we've really lost a lot of the memory. Uh, the political cycle has turned back to believing that homeownership is great and good and we must do it and get people in with very little equity regardless of their credit score. So um, the one favorable thing is right now uh, housing prices are not at the elevated levels they were before, but they will be at some point. Uh, we will see a housing price will turn again. Um, the we still have a lot. We do have a lot of subprime credit in the market today, mostly in the form of FHA. But Fannie and Freddie still have a lot, but it's less than they had before. Um, and so there is some market awareness of this. What I would say, the one silver lining is that a lot of market participants who did get burned and had some of their own money on the line are a little more jaded. But all of the bad public policies that contribute to the moral hazard and distortions in our mortgage market are worse today than they were before the crisis. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts, P-O-D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.